Hello, and welcome to our consolidation lesson on the section on biodiversity in grade 11, Life Sciences. At the end of the last lesson, we had looked at the wide variety of living things on Earth. Now, scientists group these organisms into different groups, and that's what we looked at in the last lesson. Now, what you have to be able to do is you have to be able to interpret a scientific diagram showing the relationship between the different types of organisms. And that's what we're going to be looking at now. This picture here is called a phylogenetic tree or a family tree and it shows the different groups, okay? Bacteria, protists, fungi, and our two kingdoms of animals and plants. So it does look like a bit of a tree, but there is a secret to this. When you look at a phylogenetic tree like this, it gives you quite a bit of information. It tells you which living things are more closely related to each other. It also tells you which living things are more simple or primitive. In other words, they don't have a very, very complicated structure, body, way of life, things like that. So right at the bottom here, we have the simple organisms, the organisms we call primitive. At the top, okay, so that's your primitive. And at the top, we have the advanced organisms. What this does is it shows us a couple of things. It shows us which organisms are closely related. For example, if we look at these two, mollusks and annelids are more closely related to each other because they're closer to each other on the tree than earthworms and nematodes, which are also a type of worm. So what this does is it shows you how closely related the different groups of animals or plants are. It also shows you which organisms originated way back in time. So lower down on the list here, okay, these are the organisms which existed at earlier times, whereas the organisms more towards the top are the ones that weren't in existence a couple of hundred million years ago. So you can get quite a bit of information from a phylogenetic tree. And later on, we'll be looking at an example of questions on a phylogenetic tree. What we're going to spend the rest of this lesson on is <coughs> how are you supposed to answer questions on this? What type of questions? What do you actually need to know? There's a wide variety of different questions. First of all, you have recall questions. So there are some things you have to learn. And what you have to do is you have to identify the organisms. Is it a moss? Is it a fern? Is it an earthworm? Say what group or kingdom they belong to. And then you will have to label the different parts. For example, of the moss that is the moss capsule of the bacterium that is the bacterial coat. So those are the simplest questions and in most tests there will be some type of simple have you learnt your work. Then the next thing you need to know is the distinguishing characteristics of the different groups. In other words, why is an annelid an annelid? What characteristics do all annelids have? And very often you'll be given a picture, let's say, of an annelid and asked for two or three characteristics of that particular group. So you do need to know those characteristics. Then, sadly enough, terminology. <laughs> 
and I know there's a lot of terminology, but it is quite important that you actually know what the different terms mean. Let's look at some examples. For example, in this question, it is identifying. What is this organism? It is an amoeba. What is that part? Why is that there? What is that part called? Why is that there? How does it enable the amoeba to survive? And this could be of a fungus, of a bacterium, of a virus, any of the organisms in any of the kingdoms that you've looked at. Then, <clears throat> recall, you have to know the distinguishing characteristics of the groups. Okay, and here's an example. You have a look at the picture, and I'm sure you all recognize the picture. You will have seen our little friends scurrying around your house. These are the questions that can be asked. What kingdom does it belong to? It's got legs, so it's an arthropod. List four distinguishing characteristics of this kingdom. Cephalization. It has a coelom. It has bilateral symmetry. It has sense organs. It is triploblastic. Any four distinguishing characteristics. Then you are also often asked, well, why is it important to have appendages? Why is it important to have sense organs? So obviously having appendages means you can run away from danger or you can catch food easily. If they were talking about sense organs, eyes, you can see danger coming. So you have to understand why these characteristics are important. And then this one, terminology, yep, some things you just have to learn. Then, not all questions are on recall. Many questions are going to test your understanding of what is going on, your understanding of the relationships between the different organisms. So we're now looking at understanding and we're looking at the relationships between organisms in the different groups. For example, if we look at this for plants, and they're all from the different plant groups. And then you will be asked questions on that. For example, always starting off with which, to which plant groups do they belong? Bryophytes, pterophytes, angiosperms, gymnosperms. Then you will be asked, why is plant B more advanced than plant A? A is a moss. B is a fern, and the main reason is, of course, that ferns will have xylem and phloem. They will have tissues, and of course, they also have root stems and leaves. Then there will be other questions comparing the method of reproduction in B and D, which is a fern and a gymnosperm, which is the most effective. Compare the method of reproduction, spur, ferns, sorry, Ferns reproduce by means of spores, whereas pines reproduce by means of seeds. But then you would have to say, why are seeds the most effective method? And that is, of course, because they've got food in them, they have a protective coating around them, things like that. Then questions are also often asked about where they actually live. Okay, which of these would need to live in a damp habitat? And that's also a sign of which is more simple, because those that have got are very, or those that are very complex, have got protective layers around them, like a cuticle. Whereas poor old moss doesn't have a cuticle. So in a dry area, the moss will die. So that's why it's got to live in a damp habitat. Can you see what I mean? This is now comparing the different aspects of the different groups. In understanding the work, you also could be asked on the importance 
of the characteristics in aiding the survival of the organisms. And here's another example, this time with animals, two animals, a sheep and a hydra or a sea anemone. And you will be asked all sorts of questions. First of all, what type of gut, which is a through gut and a gut with one opening. You could be asked which type of gut is advantageous, which is better for being able to digest as much food as possible for survival. Also ask simple questions, to which phylum do they belong? Blood system, explain why blood system is important. And all of these help you with understanding the difference between the more simple and the more advanced organisms. This is the next one, progression from simple to complex, and that's what we were looking at in the last couple of slides. You have to understand and you have to be able to compare and be able to see which organisms are the most simple. I'm sure your minds are getting a bit mixed up, so maybe it's time to take a break. Welcome back. Hope your brains are fresh because we're now getting into the more difficult types of questions that you could be asked. So, let's have a look. Next type of question is application. And it commonly involves reading passages, for example, on different diseases, and being able to extract relevant information from the text. It's a bit like a comprehension passage, but what it requires you to do is extract the information and then link it to what you've actually done in class. So it's a mixture of a comprehension passage and what you've actually learnt. That's this being able to link what you have learnt to new information. Now, these are quite common questions or a common type of question, which I'm sure you've come across before. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because the one I'm going to spend time on is the one that is fairly new for this section. In other words, interpreting the phylogenetic trees. Now, the phylogenetic trees can be given in a variety of different forms. At the beginning of this lesson, we got something that looked like a tree. Now we have something that looks like lines and roads, but it's still showing the same type of information. And you have to be able to understand what information this is giving you. Okay, so first of all, the diagram is a phylogenetic tree. The type, it's called a cladogram and you'll probably do more of that when you get to matric and it shows the relationships between the different animal phyla. So the letters represent different characteristics and where the phyla differ from each other you get a branching off effect. And you have to be able to understand, like for example, those are all the different phyla. And the lines actually indicate the relationships between them. So let's have a look at the questions. Now, most questions start off with something simple, just to get you into it. For example, give an example of a cnidarian like a sea anemone and an annelid like an earthworm. Easy peasy. Then it gets slightly more difficult and it says, okay, now look at the cladogram and see which characteristic is shared by all animals, the organisms in the animal kingdom, and that is obviously they are all multicellular. Now we're getting a bit more difficult. Which letter represents each of the following characteristics? And to be able to answer this question, you need to understand what differentiates the different groups from each other. First one, endoskeleton. And endoskeleton's got to be D because the chordates are the only ones with an endoskeleton. 
Okay, then triploblastic. Which organisms are triploblastic? And that is platyhelminthes onwards. So that would be characteristic B. Coelom would be characteristic C because platyhelminths have don't have a coelom and the others do have a coelom. Bilateral symmetry. That could also be B because all of the organisms, platyhelminthes onwards, have bilateral symmetry and differentiation. Differentiates the sponges and the cnidarians. So for this question, you really have to understand the difference between the different phyla. Okay, then it says write down the names that have the characteristic represented by C, and that's quite straightforward because that would simply be those three phyla. Then, explain why the development of a coelom is of importance to animals, and here we go back to the question, why are the different characteristics important? And that is so that the gut can function independently of the body wall, and there's space for all sorts of organs to develop. Next one, advantages of bilateral symmetry. Movement, left hand, right hand, and I'm sure you've actually done that in class. Then, lastly, how would bacteria differ from all the organisms, apart from being unicellular, and the key bacteria, they are prokaryotic, and all of the organisms in this diagram are eukaryotic, they have a proper nucleus. Then, also in this particular section, it lends itself to practical skills because there are lots of experiments, there's lots of experimental results. So quite a lot of practical skills can be tested. You can be given experiments and asked, well, what's happening here? Why is this happening? You can be given an experiment and be asked, well, what do you think is going to happen in this experiment? And there you will use your knowledge and understanding to actually be able to figure out what you think will happen. Sometimes you are given experiments and you have to look and say, okay, well, what will the result of this experiment be? And then, of course, graphing, tables, all of your experimental skills. Please also remember things like the different variables, hypothesis, conclusion. All of those can be asked with relation to a particular experiment that is being described to you. Okay, let's look at an example where you're looking at bacteria were grown, an antibiotic was put on them, then they were allowed to grow again and then given the same antibiotic and this was repeated eight times and then you have to look at the graph and the first thing is what is the graph telling you? Okay and if we look what happens here each successive application of antibiotics what's happening to the number of bacteria that survive? it gets less. In other words, the bacteria are being killed off. But oops, what do we notice there? What's happening to the antibiotic? It's becoming less effective because the bacteria are now developing resistance to that particular antibiotic. Let's have a look at the questions. Question one, name the independent variable, and that's the variable we are changing, which is the number of treatments. If you'd been asked for the dependent variable, it would be the percentage of bacteria surviving after each treatment. Then, very often there are simple questions regarding your ability to extract information from the graph, 
And the first one is what percentage of bacteria survived after the first treatment, which is 20. And you would then say, okay, 20% of 200 million bacteria, and you can calculate the number of bacteria that survived. Um, very often you're asked to do simple calculations from the graphs. Then, a theory question, what is an antibiotic? Then, explain what is happening to cause the results. Okay, and here you would have to be talking about how the bacteria are becoming resistant to the antibiotic and the antibiotic isn't destroying the bacteria. The last specific aim in life sciences is after understanding and knowing what you've done in class, you need to be able to link what you've learned in class to real life. And there will always be some type of questions linking the science you've learned at school to what is happening in real life. And those are questions on specific AIM-3, which is life sciences and how it affects what's happening in the world. So we're looking at life science in the world and this is a lot of linking and this requires you to know what you've learned about bacteria in class but then understand why washing your hands is important when you don't want to catch coronavirus for example or washing your hands is important when you've been outside and your hands are full of bacteria which are too small and you can't actually see them. So it's linking real life to what's happening in the classroom. Okay, and here, there are very examples here, coronavirus, malaria, cholera, all of these diseases, flu, swine flu a couple of years ago. Very often, you will get a passage on information from a particular disease, and you are then asked to link it back to what you've actually done in class. For example, malaria is a protist. Cholera is a bacterium. Coronavirus is a virus. And you could then be asked to link what you've learned about a virus to specifically what's happening with coronavirus. Then, you also need to know the different diseases and how humans deal with the different diseases. For example, antibiotics. There will be questions on antibiotics, the efficiency of antibiotics. For example, why can antibiotics not be used for coronavirus? Because antibiotics don't act on viruses. Um, you also should have learned in class how vaccines work and of course, in today's times, we have a problem with people being hesitant to get a vaccine against coronavirus. And you could be given information on this and asked to evaluate people's stances, why people think like this, what do you think, things like that.